still amazing to think about what software can do. To think that, for example, if you have a, um, a self-driving car, the visual subsystem of a self-driving car can take a picture such as this one, the picture of a road, and identify items of interest like other vehicles and pedestrians, and it can do that in a fraction of a second. But leaving along the fraction of a second, if I were to write software that does this, I wouldn't know how to do it. It simply looks astounding, it's incredible. And uh, that's why I want to talk about deep learning for people who don't know about deep learning. So if you already know about machine learning or deep learning, then this will be probably too basic for you. In that case, I won't be uh, offended if you leave, absolutely, but if you don't know much or anything at all about these topics, then this is probably for you. It's gonna be a bit high level. I'm not gonna go into many technical details because that would take way too much time. But so that also means that if you don't understand a few technical details, that's the intention. You don't have to watch these like you watch, you know, National Geographic documentaries. You don't have to become a biologist to enjoy the animals. So this is a documentary about deep learning. Let's put it like this. What I want to do is to suggest that it's not magic, just technology. So if I achieve that, I will be fine. I will be happy. So. The basic idea, let's start from the basics. Let's start from the idea of supervised learning, which is the idea that deep learning is ultimately based upon. And supervised learning is about essentially matching data, matching input to some kind of output, where the input and the output can be a lot of different things. So for example, if the input is the picture of an animal, and the output is the name of the animal, then you have a system that recognizes pictures of animals and names them. How can this system ever know that we are looking at a duck? Assuming, I mean, I, I, I drew that duck and I can tell you it's a duck. So how can the system recognize it? The idea of supervised learning is that the system knows because I gave the system a lot of examples. So before I can even think about building such a system, I have to collect examples of animal pictures and animal names. So I need both the input and the output. I need many of them. For something this complicated, probably a few thousands, uh, sorry, probably more like hundreds of thousands. It, it doesn't hurt if there are millions. So I just collect a lot of examples. And then I pass these examples to an algorithm and the algorithm munches the examples over and over again until it understands the relation between the picture of an animal and the name of an animal. This is called the training phase. This is the slow, expensive phase. And then, then there is a second phase where you get your money back. This is the prediction phase and during the prediction phase you just show the picture of an animal to the algorithm and the algorithm tells you what kind of animal it is. So that's just one example, but X and Y, the input and the output can be a lot of different things. So yes, pictures and names of animals, but they can be things that are even more complicated than that. So if your input is English sentences and your output is Japanese and you have a system that's sophisticated enough to understand that and you have enough data to train this system, then congratulations, you just built Google Translate. Or the input could be the picture of a road and the output could be the positions of other vehicles. So that's the general idea at a very, very abstract level. Let's go just one level deeper, one level of abstraction down. So let's say, sorry, to, uh, to find a simple example, let's say I have a solar panel on my roof and the solar panel is generating power. And I want to predict how much power it generates during the day. So the input would be 
the time of the day, and the output would be the power that the solar panel generates. And I collect examples, okay? I just put the examples here on this chart. So I have the time of day and I have the power it generates. And let's say that after some collecting, I get this shape, this cloud of dots. Then I pass these examples to a supervised learning algorithm. What does the algorithm do really? What it does is that it looks at this complicated cloud of examples and it approximates them with something simpler. Maybe something that looks like this, a function that looks like this. And once you have this simpler explanation for the word, for what is happening, you can forget about the examples entirely. You can just use this function to predict the future, to say how much power am I going to generate at noon, for example, it's going to be 260. So this is the core idea of supervised learning and ultimately deep learning. It finds a function that approximates the examples. You give it a lot of complicated real world things and it finds something much simpler that kind of gets close. And then it uses that simpler thing to predict the future. Let's go one level deeper by looking into even more detail into the, this process by looking at a specific, a sp an especially simple case, which is called the linear regression. So let's say that I collect examples for this problem. I have a restaurant and I collect uh, reservations in the afternoon and then I sell a certain number of pizzas at night. I don't know why I like examples based on Italian food. And uh, then I get these examples collected, okay? And I want a system that forecasts the pizzas. I want to know how many pizzas I'm likely to sell based on a certain number of reservations that I got today. This is a lucky situation because these dots are arranged roughly in a line, so I can use a line to approximate them. And, uh, well, it's not perfect, but we are predicting pizza here, so we don't need to be super precise. This looks good enough. And the reason why I say this is lucky is that a line has a pretty simple equation that I can use to implement the line in software. Uh, you probably remember it from high school. I didn't, but I looked it up and, uh, well, each country calls those parameters in a different way. Uh, I just call them A and B. So a line is just two parameters, which are, by the way, the slope of the line, how steep the line is, and the intersection of the line with the vertical axis. But that's way too much detail. The important part here is you have two parameters. If you have those two parameters, A and B, then you have the line. The line is those parameters. So once you have the line, once you have A and B, you can use the line to predict the future with this function, for example. So this is a, a one-liner, one line, one and uh, it just takes x, the number of reservations, and the line, and then it uses the equation of the line to predict the number of pizzas. So prediction is the easy part. The harder part is actually finding the line. How do I find the line that approximates those points? I wish I had 20 extra minutes, which I don't, to explain exactly how that works, but just to give you the idea, the basic idea of this algorithm is that any line that I can find is going to be wrong, right? It's an approximation. So, for example, if I ask the line, how many pizzas am I going to sell for 14 reservations, the line is going to tell me, for example, in this case, 28. But if I look at the real life examples that I'm using, that's the truth actually picked from the real world. In this case, I had 14 reservations and I sold a different number of pizzas. So there is a distance there, that tiny orange thing, there is an error there. So the idea is that if I average the error over all the examples, then I get the error of the line. And uh, the algorithm proceeds by starting from any line and then trying to reduce the error until it gets the lowest error it can get or until 
it decides to stop because it's taking too long computing a better line and it's not worth it anymore. So now I can be a little bit more precise. Supervised learning is about approximating the examples and it does that by starting with a random function and then tweaking the function until it gets the lower possible error. This is linear regression, which means approximating with the line, but actually the most complicated cases of deep learning work pretty much the same way. It's just a more complex function that we're talking about. So let's recap, because I understand that's a lot of information. I have real world data, I want to approximate it with a line that is two parameters A and B. To find those parameters, I use the error of the line. I try to minimize that with an algorithm. And once I have that line, I can use it to predict the future. And this is the system overall, right? It's this tiny yellow box with the equation of the line and it gets X a certain number of reservations and it has a couple of parameters that it found during training and out comes the number of pizzas. And just to be slightly more concrete, here is some Ruby code that implements these. I don't have time, unfortunately, to linger on the code, but it's just to show you that it's not particularly long or complicated. I'm using this NUMO, um, make it bigger, this NUMO uh, library, which is a numerical library that has a powerful array type. This is the prediction code. And this is the training code, the code that ultimately finds A and B. As you can see, it's not super long. It starts with two random, rather zero, parameters here. It goes on for a few iterations until it finds a way to get the best parameters. And this is the main code. Here it loads data. Here it trains the system for an arbitrary number of iterations to find good values for these parameters. And then it says we have 25 reservations. How many pizzas can we expect to sell? And then it also draws a chart that shows the data and the line so that we can visually check whether it's working as we expect. And if I run this thing, you can see that these are the iterations and this number is dropping a little bit every time. This is the error. It's called the loss in machine learning. That's just machine learning lingo for error. And in the end, after 10,000 iterations, it finds these two parameters and it tells us that for 25 reservations, we can expect to sell about 40 pizzas. And then it also prints out a small chart showing the examples and the line that approximates that. Okay, so there is something, there is that, but uh, we are still a far cry from implementing something that can recognize images, for example. So we have to add a couple more compl complexities to the system to make it more powerful. I will uh, go over these real fast without lingering on the technical details. One is that most real world problems are not this simple. At the very least, the pizzas I sell do not depend on a single thing. They might depend on multiple things like the temperature, is it a nice warm day today? Are there many people in the street? The number of tourists in the street on a scale from one to 10, for example. And I might want to consider all these factors. What happens when I have multiple inputs rather than just one input? Well, with one input, I can draw a 2D chart such as this one and approximate that cloud of examples with a line. If I add one more input than, for example, temperature, then the chart has to be 3D and I cannot use a line anymore. I have to use one more dimension to approximate them a plane. And the equation of a plane doesn't have two parameters, it has three. And I can go on and on like that by adding dimensions. I cannot draw them anymore. 
but uh, I can just abstract away the problem. So one input variable you approximate with a line, two parameters, two input variables it's a plane, three parameters, and then you go into more and more dimensions, more and more parameters. So what happens to our system is um, first I have more inputs, so those parameters there A and B they become more parameters, so let's just cluster them in a single array and call it W for weights. That's a common name in machine learning. And that equation becomes a more general equation that is called the linear combination of the inputs and the weights, or you can call it the dot product, or if you wish, the matrix multiplication. It's, it's a snack. It just scales with the number of parameters, okay? And in the end, you still get a prediction. And that's the first complexity that I wanted to add to our model. There is a second complexity, which is in many interesting problems, I don't try to predict any number. I try to predict an enumerator, if you wish, one of a small number of possible outcomes. So for example, if I don't say how many pizzas am I going to sell, but rather, um, will I break even? Will I make a profit with my restaurant today? that's either one or zero. So I don't want to get 42 out of the system. I want to get something that's between one and zero. Either zero, no, you're not gonna make a profit, one, yes, or something in between for uh, uncertainty, like 0 0.7, yeah, you are probably going to make a profit, but maybe not. To do that, I can just add a function in there that takes whatever comes out of the yellow box and for example squeezes it so that it's between one and zero that's what i would do in this case but that function can be many different things depending on the problem that you exactly want to solve uh, in this case i'm predicting something that's boolean if i want to predict something that is one of a number of things for example the animal recognition system that recognizes these three kinds of animals, then conceptually I just use three Boolean classifiers, that is recognizers, and then I let them all lose on the same picture and they will come up with uh, numbers between zero and one. So in this case, for example, the duck classifier is saying 0 0.02, this is almost certainly not a duck, the cat classifier seems to be m much more optimistic about this thing being a cat, so the cat classifier is winning in this case, okay? So now I can merge all this stuff into one system. By the way, when I say we use three classifiers, I don't need that we literally run the same code three times. Essentially, I'm just adding some dimension to a matrix. So now we have something that is classifying data. It can learn data and classify it. How powerful is this thing? You might think that, first of all, uh, you might think that it would require a lot of code, but no, not quite. I mean, it's a, a little bit more code than we had earlier on. Here it is but it's not much, honestly. In this case, what I am doing, to be precise, is um, I'm taking a very popular data set that is called MNIST, which is essentially a collection of handwritten digits from zero to nine. It contains 70,000 handwritten digits. I'm showing you a few just to make it clear that this is the real thing. I mean some of these people had really crappy handwriting competing with uh, my own handwriting. So some of these numbers are not super easy to identify. And each number is a matrix of 28 by 28 grayscale pixels, each pixel a byte. So what I did, uh, it's not like it's an original idea, what everybody does, is uh, I picked these pixels and I flatten them into a long line of variables. So each pixel becomes an input variable, just like reservations and temperature. 
So this is a problem with uh, 784 input variables. It's 784 di dimensional. Apart from that, the system has no notion that these are digits. It just sees uh, numbers, it could be anything. And, okay, this is, uh, this is the code that does the optimization by reducing the error. This code is just trying to check, it's, it's uh, just checking how many predictions are valid. And this sigmoid here is the function that squeezes numbers into the zero one range. This predict is essentially this process. Multiply, uh, make a dot product of the inputs by the weights and then pass them to the sigmoid. And this classify method is uh, this process. Look at the outputs and pick the best one. And this little, num uh, little uh, program is uh, actually, I started it before my presentation, and it's actually able, so that I don't get confused, sorry folks, to guess the digit correctly over 90% of the time. So this is a computer vision program that is actually working out of a few lines of pure Ruby. I'm not using any machine learning library or similar module. I'm just doing it from scratch by implementing that stuff line by line, okay? It took about 20 minutes to get there. So it's actually surprisingly powerful. The problem it has is that even if you leave it running for a very long time, much more than 20 minutes, it will never get much better than that. And the reason for that is uh, not very obvious and it's gonna take us to another important topic. The reason why that system is never gonna do really well on that digit recognition task is that here is another artificial example. Imagine that you're trying to predict whether a Hollywood movie will be successful or not. And uh, you have two input variables, which are how much money was spent on marketing and the preview ratings that the movie got. And you collect examples based on past movies and you get, for example, these two clouds where uh, blue squares are successful movies and the green triangles are failures at the box office. Of course, this is fake data. I just came up with it, just to make it clear. So will our system do well on this data? It probably will, because this data has a quality that is perfect for systems like ours. This data is what a mathematician would call linearly separable. That is, you could draw a straight line here that separates the two clusters, the two classes of data. This means that our system will have no trouble separating the data, because our system, if you think about it, is still based on the original idea of tracing a line or a plane or something straight. So it's not very good at drawing, drawing carved shapes. Actually, it can't. So it can only draw straight stuff. The problem, uh, so it will draw this line and then it will say, okay, everything in that camp is gonna be successful. Everything here is gonna be a flop and it's gonna work. The problem, of course, is that real life data doesn't look like this. It's much more likely to look like this. And now our system is in trouble, right? It can make a valiant attempt at separating blue and green by tracing lines, but the best it can do, the data is fake here once again, but I actually ran the system over this data. This is what it did. Okay, it kind of tried to separate blue and green but of course, at some point, it's going to fail. It cannot get better than these. But what we can do is to take this system and then take another similar system and connect them so that the first one is feeding into the second one. This is called a neural network. And this thing can draw curves because of the mathematics behind it. So if I let this system lose on this data, and I did, 
this is what I got. Now we're really talking, okay? And in fact, I try to implement, I try to implement this neural network in Ruby. I'm, I didn't run it because uh, running it for any significant result takes hours. Uh, it's a bit longer than the code I showed you earlier. In particular, the optimization algorithm yet becomes way more complicated now that we have multiple levels to go through. But in the end, I could get close to 99% accuracy on digit recognition. And it's still pure Ruby. So once again, no libraries. And it still works on the same exact principles that we had before. It finds a function to approximate the examples. It starts with a random function and then it reduces the error by twisting and bending this function around the data until it finally finds a function that has a low enough error. And this works with images, it works with sound data, it works with a lot of different kinds of data. So what is deep learning? At a very basic level, it is uh, three things. First, one thing that we found out was that as we keep adding layers to these neural networks, they become two things. They become smarter first. They become better and better at approximating even more twisted and gnarly data like visual data, for example. And the second thing they become is they become harder to train and they require a lot of power. So what happened was that until the 90s, we didn't have the techniques to train these complicated beasts and we didn't have the processing power mostly, but now we do. So we are using very deep neural networks and because the results are so striking, we had to attach a marketing brand to it, and that's deep learning. A second thing that deep learning is, so many layers. Second thing that it is, is a data hog. So it wants more data than you can throw with it. And once again, we didn't have so much data in the past, but now we do, uh, we don't. Uh, Google does, Facebook does, okay? So they're doing it and they're throwing in more and more sophisticated neural networks. And of course, they have the computer power to do that and the engineering expertise. And the third thing that I would say deep learning is, is specialized neural networks. What I showed you is a very generic architecture, but a smart neural network knows that it's dealing, for example, with pictures. So instead of destroying pictures the way I did by, you know, smeltering them into a long line of pixels, it will probably keep into account the geometry of the pictures. So it has specific layers that take care of that. Or if you are dealing with language, which is a flow of information, it will deal specifically with that. And just because I think that we are still on time, are we? Yeah. So I'm going to show you one specialized architecture that I love just because it's so cool. I, uh, it, I think this is one of the best ideas in, uh, in software in the next, uh, in the last uh, like 20 years. It's just amazing. It's called the uh, Generative Adversarial Networks. I think it's, uh, it's from a few years ago, like three years ago. And uh, it, shortens to GAN, so you might have heard about these things. They work like this. So, quick recap of what a neural network in general is like is, uh, let me unskip this stuff. I didn't hope I would make it. As a black box, this is a system that takes weights, that is a configuration, and then it takes an input, like in this case, it tries to distinguish cats from owls, okay? The bird looks a bit sleepy because I actually drew this picture yesterday night, so there it looks like I did. And, uh, and then it comes up with uh, 
a yes, no answer. And the point of the neural network is that it will try to minimize error. So for example, the error in this neural network would be, you got it wrong, you said it's 0 0.7, uh, sorry, 70% a cat, but it's not, or the other way around, okay? So uh, let's stop looking at the internals and look at this black box. If we look at these, then we can build a neural network that, for example, recognizes horses. So it can take the picture of a horse, the photo of a horse, and the photo of something that is not a horse, and discriminate between the two. This is the horse discriminator, right? And come up with a yes, no, yes, no, this is a horse, this is a horse. And uh, the error is, uh, you said it's a horse, but you got it wrong. Now, take this network, put it aside, and build a second neural network. And the second one is called the horse generator. And the horse generator is taking a special input, which is just random noise. You just generate random stuff. And it still has its weights, and it's, it works based on weights, but what it outputs is random noise in the form of an image, okay, random pixels. But here's the twist. The error that you train this thing on is take this image, pass it to the horse discriminator. Can the horse discriminator tell you that this is not a horse? And that's the error that we evaluate this horse generator on. So essentially, if you manage to cheat the discriminator, good. If you don't, then that's an error. Try to minimize that error. And then you start from scratch. In the very beginning, all the weights are random. So the discriminator cannot tell a horse from white noise. And the generator can only generate white noise. But then you start training them, and you loop that. What would you expect to happen then? Uh, uh, let me show you what happens. I picked another popular set of training data, which is called the CIFAR-10. It's a bunch of images. Uh, low resolution, low enough not to melt my max CPU. And uh, some of them depict horses. So I selected the pictures that depict horses, which are not many. I think there are 6,000 or 60,000 maybe. I have a note here, sorry. Well, they are not enough for a really good experiment, but they are enough to have some fun. And then I downloaded some code from the internet. It's Python code, and I hacked it a little bit to work on these images. And then I built a system exactly like this one. And if you look at the result, in the very beginning, this is what the generator is producing. White noise, just random images. But within 50 iterations, you already see that something has happened. The discriminator is getting good, right? It starts to distinguish between this stuff and real horses. So it's saying, oh no, you're not cheating me. This is not a horse. And the generator has to keep up. So by 50 iterations, it understood that the discriminator likes uh, blobs of color inside the pictures that look like something as opposed to randomly distributed white noise. And as we go forward, At some point, the generator can understand that green and brown are good. The discriminator likes those colors. It gets, it gets trapped by those, tripped by those colors. It uh, takes them for horses. And it goes on like that for a long time. So I just went to sleep. And after like 20, 27 hours, after about 10, one million iterations? Well, these are horses for sure. I mean, some of those are uh, weird. 
they kind of lack limbs or heads. But look at those things. I mean, they, they kind of look like horses, right? Uh, they are, this thing is learning to generate horses like that. And the amazing thing about, about this idea, this technology, is that if you look at how it works, the generator has never seen a horse. It's just trying to cheat the discriminator. In fact, the horses that it generates don't look like the horses that we're using to train the discriminator. They just look like their own thing, only horse-ish. And if you, if you move on, from my humble Mac and that tiny Python program, which was like three screens of code, and you do it with a huge rack of GPUs and very, very powerful hardware and, um, and a very, very powerful algorithm, you can do stuff like this. So this, uh, this site is called This Person Does Not Exist because this person literally does not exist. She doesn't look like anybody in existence. It's just the product of a generational adversary network, generative adversary network, that was trained on picture of, pictures of people. And uh, it just generates pictures all the time. I could stare at these all the time. It's just amazing. And of course, it's been used in so many different fields. Sometimes uh, it, it's, a, it's a nice game to try and understand, uh, to try and guess defects in these pictures. And uh, usually you have a hard time. Sometimes it gets trouble with uh, uh, symmetry, for example. Some people have a, a bigger ear than the other ear or uh, stuff like this, but uh, overall, I think this is just amazing. This is incredible. But I hope that I made my point that it's not magic. It looks like it, but it's not magic. So sorry if I kept at a very high technical level. Shameless plug, I have this book out in beta since a few weeks. So this one goes into a much deeper level. It actually explains things line of code by line of code. Disclaimer, it's in Python. The examples are in Python. Uh, not my favorite, but what the industry demands in this field, so marketing. And I guess that's it. Thank you. Time for questions? So you go into issue? You you mean the bias in uh, training yes. code? Oh yeah, uh, well yeah. Yeah, thank you. I was hoping for this. <laughs> because I'm politically aware of or at least I hope I am. The problem, of course, is that now people are starting to use these systems for a number of reasons, uh, some of which are uh, ethically challenging. Like, for example, uh, I personally would not want a machine to decide on its own whether I should get a loan for my house or not. And uh, matter of fact, that's what's happening. And uh, one problem with these algorithms is they are mostly opaque. You don't know why they took the decision they took. The reason is hidden in the hundreds of thousands of weights inside the network. So it's not parsable by a human. So one thing that we noticed was that these systems do not take 
the right decisions or even better, they take exactly our decisions. So recently one uh, case that made the news was Amazon, right? In uh, their hiring process, they were using an artificial intelligence. It was working perfectly. It was only hiring middle-aged white guys. So exactly like people did, because that's the data it was trained on. So yeah, well, I think we are screwed just to um, wrap it up. Unfortunately, this is a very sorry state of things. I think that the only way out would be more awareness, but I was uh, really scared recently at a machine learning conference because one guy stepped on stage and he was like, oh, we have this system that identifies bad guys from, um, uh, from newspaper articles, from news articles, so that they will not get loans, for example. And uh, by bad guy, that meant anybody who had exposed him or herself in the news, essentially. And he was complaining like, oh, some banks didn't want to use this because they say they don't trust the system. And I was like, whoa, it's, I, I would never think I would say this, but hooray for banks. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, this is the situation. I wish I was smarter to have a solution for this. Does that avoid your question? The question was whether there is any intrinsic structure in the generator of the uh, generative adversarial network. Uh, in this spe specific architecture, yeah, it was uh, a deconvolutional network. So it uh, essentially knew that it was dealing with images. images. So it, uh, what it generated was something that, uh, that scaled well through the system to become image-like, like similar pixels carried, uh, close by pixels carried the different meanings that, than pixels that were far away. So uh, that was one of those cases, uh, like I said, where you have an architecture that kind of knows that it's dealing with some specific kind of data. Uh, in other words, if we try to use the exact same architecture to generate sounds, it probably wouldn't do a great job. Or to generate text. Then you need a different architecture. But that's all the specifics in this architecture. It didn't know horses, for example. It just knows, uh, uh, hey, I'm generating something that has a geometry. Conceptually, that's the idea. Does that answer? Even come. Uh, one last question, I guess. I want my question. The usual trick is to wait five minutes until somebody is embarrassed enough <laughs> to ask a question no matter what, but I don't have five minutes, unfortunately. So thank you.